Welcome to Chapter 12 of the training videos for Matrix Games World in Flames. My name is Stephen Hokanson. This chapter covers production planning, production, and politics. Right now we are looking at the end of turn phases for January-February 1940 turn. We are in the production planning final phase. Germany is making their decisions for production planning. This form was covered partially in an earlier training video, but I'll go through it in more detail now. At the top of this form in the center is a summary page for the selected major power. We are looking at Germany, so all the numbers and statistics that are shown on this page right now are for Germany. On the left-hand side are the other Axis powers, and we could change and look at the production planning for Italy or Japan. We also could go over to the Allied powers, which are on the right, for China, Commonwealth, USA, and so on. This last button over here, which is the same size as the flags, are for the uncontrolled resources. When you click on this, instead of looking at the resources for a major power, you see all the resources that none of the major powers currently control. Below the summary statistics is a list of all of the resources and factories currently controlled or being sent to Germany. They are sorted with the non-oil resources first, and then the oil resources, saved oil, build points, and last on the list are the factories. At the bottom of the page is a detailed map, and by using the switch map button you can change this to a global map. The finalized production button down here is for closing the form. You also have the option of skipping to another major power and finalizing production for that prior to doing it for Germany. And there's help over here for the form. The other elements of this form layout are the three different styles of layout. We're looking at the summary. The other two are the expanded view and the root view. In the lower left is a list of filters. By clicking on one of these radio buttons, the program will filter the list of resources and factories. The other items over here, which are radio buttons, are controls for you determining what you want to have happen to your various resources. To start with the summary statistics up at the front, there are factories on the left, then there's a column of oil resources, then the non-oil resources with the, with the summation of all resources, both oil and non-oil, at the bottom of the third column. The fourth column has production points and saved oil points, and the rightmost column has build points and convoys. Starting with factories, Germany has 24. None of them are idle. All 24 are currently producing. It has two controlled oil resources. It's also getting four oil points in trade. It has two of those oil points idle, and it's using three of them in production. For non-oil, it controls 12. It's getting 10 in trade, and it is also conveying two of those points from overseas to its factories in Germany. All told, there are 21 non-oil resources being used by Germany and three oil, which gives them the 24 resources supplying the 24 factories, and that results in 24 production points. There's no strategic bombing losses, so they have net 24 production points, and their multiple right now is 0 0.75. So the number of build points they're going to get is 18, 24 times 0.75. They get 18 build points. They're also sending two of those points in return trade, so they end up with 16 build points available. As for saved oil points, they start with one and they're currently keeping that one for future use. They have 11 convoys on the map. Nine of them are not being used. Only two are being used in order to convey resources to the factories in Germany. When we look at the table of resources, you have a type, you have a location, you have what is happening to that resource, and its destination. So the non-oil resource in the Netherlands is being used in production at Leipzig. And if I click on these, the one in the Netherlands, it map centers on that resource. If I click on Leipzig, then it centers on that. You can also use this to find, you know, what's the resource at 5040? It's the one sitting right next to Berlin. And where is it going? It's going to Prague. At the bottom of this list of resources, we can see the trade that's coming in. The USSR is sending a resource, this one over here by Sverdlovsk, to Germany, and Germany is using it at the factory in Stettin. There's another one coming in from Ufa, 
or close to UFA, being used at Essen. Another USSR resource is coming in and also being used at Essen. So Germany is getting a lot of resources and trade, and you could look at the trade agreements if you wanted to know more information about all the ones that are coming in. For the oil resources, there's one sitting in Germany, there's another one in Austria. Both of these are controlled directly by Germany. USSR is sending an oil resource from Perm, another one from Amavir. Romania is sending two of the Ploesti oil resources to Germany. So those are the four being received in trade. Here's where that saved oil resources is currently sitting in Munich. When Germany is done with its production, it'll send a build point all the way to Moscow. These are the return trade agreements. So in return for the oil and non-oil resources, Moscow is actually getting build points. And here's the factories. Germany has two in Hamburg. Both of them are producing. And as we noticed before, all the factories are producing. Another view of the resources, instead of doing the summary page at the top, is the expanded. When you click on that, you can see a lot more resources and factories on the list. This is helpful if you're trying to look at, say, all of the resources that are coming in and trade. Another way of doing this, instead of using the expanded, is to actually filter for the trade resources. So if we come down here to the trade button, we will now just see trade. And in fact, we can use all of the numbers and labels on the summary page to filter. So if I click on trade received oil resources, I get just the oil resources that are being received in trade. I can do the same for trade received non-oil. I can look at saved oil at start. I can look at which three oil points are being used in production. And essentially all the elements of the summary form are available as filters. So if we want to know what are the two convoyed resources, we click on this and we find out that they're both coming in from Sweden. And in fact, if I click on this little convoy column over here on the far right, we get a switch to the route view and we can actually see the route that the resource is using in order to get to Berlin. So we see it's coming from Karuna, it goes to Copenhagen, uses the Baltic Sea to get to Kiel, and then goes by rail to Berlin. The layout buttons have moved over here to the right when you're using the route form and I want to go back to the summary at this point. We're again still just filtering for convoyed points. I'll go down here and say no filter so that I see all of the resources in all of the factories. I want to show a little bit more about convoys so I'm going to go to Japan because they have more convoys involved in order to get their resources back to their factories. And in fact if we look over here we'll see that they have 20 convoys on the map only five are being unused, so they actually have 15 convoys being used to get resources back. However, if we look at the number of oil, there's only four, and the number of non-oil is seven, and the reason that there are 11 resources being shown here, but 15 convoys, is that some of these resources require more than one convoy. So when I select for convoyed resources, I get a lot of ones, but there are some down here at the bottom that require two resources. And as you can see, the one in Henan, China, is being conveyed through the South China Sea to the China Sea and then up to Hiroshima. That information is also shown over here on the left with the green areas indicating sea areas. The other resources that are requiring more than one convoy are the ones coming out of the Netherlands East Indies. And again, these are going up to Hiroshima and the last one is going to Kobe. All of these are being used in production. I'll go back to the summary form. Now I'll branch to Italy. And you can see that Italy has only one resource that's coming in from overseas. That's the one in Sardinia that's also being conveyed to Rome. If I switch maps back here, the detailed map centers on the resource that is in Sardinia. And clicking on Rome shows its destination factory. Going back to Germany with no filter, I want to do a little bit more work with the global map and show you what it's capable of doing. To start with, I'll look at the convoyed resources and I'll go to the route map. The route map brings up the global map and it shows in this case just the one route. By clicking on one of the other radio buttons over here, for instance Axis, I'll see not only those for Germany but also for the other active major powers. Italy's not an active major power, so we do not see the resource convoys for Italy, but we do see those for Japan. If we now click on the radio button for Allied, 
we see the active allied major powers and where their convoys are. These are all Commonwealth and French because the only those two countries are at war. If we go to show unused convoys by clicking on this checkbox, we now see for the allied major powers that are active, that are in the war, what convoys they have out at sea that are not being actively used to convey resources back to factories. The allied player will be very interested in examining this because they will want to make sure that they don't have them sitting idle where they would be vulnerable to attack by the Axis. Right now Germany has two idle oil resource points. Because this game is using the optional rules for oil and also for saving oil and build points, we would like to take these oil points and not have them be idle, but instead have them be saved. And in order to do that, we just click on the oil point, and then we go over here to the list of radio buttons as to what we would like to do with it, and we can click on Save. I'd like to save it in a different city, so I'm going to click on this section down here which says Rail and Ship, and Save. This is a default setting. The default settings will last forever, or at least until you change them. So when I click on Save, the default is to save, and now I want to say where. I'll pick out a destination, and just choosing one at random, I'll take Dusseldorf, and I'll say OK. So now what's happening is we have under a default setting for this oil point that it will be saved in Dusseldorf. When I click on Recompute, the computer goes through and calculates what's going to happen. And after recomputing with my instruction that the default will be for having that oil point saved in Dusseldorf, you can see that it's now only one idle oil resource. And there is now two that are being saved. If I click on this, it'll show me where those two points are. The one was the one that started the turn in Munich. It's still there. And the other one is the one that I just had sent to Dusseldorf. If I go back and look at the remaining idle resource, I can also set a default for that. I want it to save. Where? This time, why don't we go to Hamburg? So this time, where do I want it saved? Why don't we say Karlsruhe? And I'll just click on OK. And that default has been set. When I say Recompute, it'll recalculate what to do with all of the resources. It'll incorporate this new instruction for the second one to be saved. And now when I look at the controlled oil points, we'll have the one going to Dusseldorf, the one to Karlsruhe, and the one that started in Munich. There's a lot more that can be done with this form you can establish a specific route for moving resources across the Atlantic and delivering them into England. You can define other routes. Commonwealth has the most problems with getting resources back to their factories because the resources start in Canada, down in South America, in India, and Australia. All of these need to come back to England where all the factories sit idle unless the resources are conveyed to England from the various Commonwealth member nations. Before I leave this form, I'd like to draw your attention to some of the other entries that might be given values other than zero. You can have damaged factories, for instance. Those would not be producing. You can also have oil resources that are lost to strategic bombing. You can have oil and non-oil resources that are unable to find a path to a factory. You can also have resources that are lost to enemy zones of control, which means that the resource is sitting in a hex without a protective land unit yet there is an enemy land unit adjacent to it, and that zone of control is preventing the resource from getting to a factory. I already mentioned losing production points to strategic bombing. You also could have a problem with build points not having a path. And lastly, there is the possibility of saving build points. I've skipped ahead a few phases, and we're now in the production phase. This is the form that Germany sees when they want to produce units. On the left are all the different types of units that they can produce, giving the cost, the turns, the gearing type for that specific unit type. How many of those units are currently available in the force pool? How many you've already built this turn? How many are currently on map? And how many are off map? There is a grid that shows you the gearing limits. There are fewer types of gearing limits than there are types of units. So for instance, cavalry and cavalry divisions are both cavalry gearing type, and that's shown over here as just one gearing type cavalry, and so on for like air units, whereas we have a lot of different air units, fighters, fighters, carrier air, and naval air, they're all lumped together as one gearing type. The three columns here are January, February, built, and March, April. January, February is your limit for how many you can build this turn. 
and that's based primarily on how many you built last turn in November, December of the previous year. As you build units, the build counts will go up, and that will give you a projection for how many you're going to be able to build in March and April. Right now we're showing zero built because we've just started looking at this form, and in March, April we're going to be able to build one of everything except forts. Forts you can go up by three, so even if we don't build any in January, February, we would still be able to build three in March, April. There are a list of buttons over here on the right. You can look at your force pool, look at your build ahead force pool. You can go back to the resources and production form that we were just looking at before. I'm going to go out to scrap units. The reason I want to look at the scrap units form is because perhaps I can scrap some poorer units, which will improve the quality of the force pool when I build new ones. If I leave the poorer ones in there, I might end up building those when the random number generator selects which units to build. For air, and these are filters for all the different air types, but if I do all the air units, I just have two, and I sort of like those. For the naval, I have a couple of those, but I'm pretty happy with what they are. For the land units, there might be some that I would like to scrap. For the land units, I'm going to scrap the first two, both the 4-4 and the 5-3. So I just click on Selected, and then I say Scrap Selected, and those two units move down here as being scrapped. I could do Undo All. That would put them back up on the list of Can Be Scrapped. Notice that this form gives me a lot of information. The first list is all of the infantry units that are on map. If we look down here in the Force Pool, these are not scrappable because their year is so recent. And they are quite nice. There are three elite units. They all have nice attack strengths of 7, 8, and 7. There are a couple divisional units available. So what is currently sitting in the force pool for infantry is quite nice. And I can actually look at the out years. And here are what the units will be in 1941. We'll be getting even better units available. So scrapping this 4-4 and this 5-3 is probably pretty good. We we'll leave the 6-3 and the 6-4, and I like the motorized units, so I'll leave those as well. When I click on OK Done, these two units will move to the scrap pool, and they will no longer be part of this game. So now we're at the point to build some units. We've got 16 build points to start with, haven't spent any of them, so I've still got 16 left. There are 33 turns, so we're not really worrying about how many turns are left. As you get towards the end of the game and there's only three or four turns, you don't want to start building units that are going to take three or four turns to arrive. For Germany, I'm going to go out here for Militia, they cost two build points. They come in right away. Go down and look at the six militia units that might come in. They're all city specific, so when they arrive, they will arrive in these cities. But they'll arrive immediately. And I'll say build, build, and I will have built two militia units. My production points have gone from 16 down to 12. And though two of the militia units have disappeared from here, I'm not sure exactly which ones I'm going to get. The program selected two for removal but once I complete my production turn by clicking on Done Production, it'll put those two units back in this list of six, and it'll randomly select two more from it. So though I've seen two disappear, I'm not really sure which units will appear as next turn's reinforcements. Having built two infantry units, Germany has reached its limit, which is why the Build Selected Unit Type is disabled here. If I click on Armor Headquarters, I'll see Rommel is available, it's the only one. I'll click on Build That Armored Headquarters, so I know Rommel will be coming in. I'm going to go down here to Fighters. These are fighters that have a cost of two, and I'll build one of those. Again, I'm not sure which one I'm going to get. I'll go down to Naval Construction. I'm going to scroll the screen down to see the remaining possibilities here. So we have Naval Construction. I'm not sure whether it's going to be five or six points. These units have already been partially built, and because they've completed their first cycle, I can select which one to continue for its second cycle. I'll choose the Sedlitz, and I'll click on Build Selected Unit Type, and I'm now at zero points built left. But there are things I still want to buy. Let me go out to Undo a Build, and the Undo a Build form shows that I've built two militia, the armored headquarters, one fighter at cost of two points, and the naval construction cruiser at a cost of two. I'll undo the naval construction. In fact, I'll undo all the builds. That'll let me start over. And you'll see that the build counts are all go to zero. I've got my 16 build points left, 
and now I can start with the most important things that I want to build first, which is the armored headquarters. I want Rommel to come in. I also want that fighter that's worth two, because I'm going to need that. I'm going to build a pilot to go with that fighter so it doesn't just sit in the air reserve. So I click on pilot, I say build. I've got four points left. I'll go back out to militia and I'll build two of those. And you can see that my gearing limits are allowing me to build three infantry next turn, two armor, and one for most of the other items except air units and pilots, which are now going to be available to build two when I get into next turn's production, March, April. And now we're over to Italy's production. Italy only has five build points available, and what it would like to do is build an anti-aircraft unit. That's going to cost four points. So when we build it, we only have one point left, and there's not a whole lot that you can build with one point, at least nothing that Italy really wants. So it's going to click on Done Production, and you get a warning message. You have one used build point. Do you want to continue? And we do. When we say yes, it asks us if we want to save that build point. And yes, we do. We'll save the build point in Milan. Currently there are none there. And we click down here and say Save Build Point. And you can see the build point immediately appears on the map. It tells us there are none left to be saved, and so we can say OK Done. Here's the production form for Japan. I'm not going to do production for Japan. Instead, I'm going to go out to the pools form and look at the reinforcements. These should include the units that we just built. I'll set the filter for this to just show the German and Italian units that are coming in. The Stuka was built in a previous turn, as was the paratrooper, the pilot, and the Italian battleship. But the two militia units are the ones that we just built. They'll come in next turn. If we go to the May-June, we'll see the fighter that we built. All these other units took more than two turns, which meant that they are built prior to 1940. When we go to July-August, we'll now see the pilot that we just built, because that takes three turns. And we'll also see the anti-aircraft gun that Italy built, taking three turns. Rommel doesn't come in until September-October, because Rommel takes four turns to build. I now want to move on to declaration of war and show you some of the politics involved in World in Flames. The saved game that I just restored is in November-December 1939. Impulse 5, the Axis, is the phasing side, and we are in the phase to declare war on major powers. Checking the weather, we see that it's snow in the Arctic and North Temperate, it's rain in the Mediterranean. But snow isn't that bad for doing attacks. So Germany is going to declare war not on a major power, but on some of the minor countries. So right now, it doesn't want to declare war on China, the United States, so we'll go over here and say done. But Italy would like to declare war on both the Commonwealth and France. To do that, you simply click on Commonwealth, we click on declare war, we get a prompt that says, you sure you want to do that? I mean, if you say yes, you're not going to be able to undo this, it's going to be permanent. We'll say yes. And now we get a line over here on war declarations that says Italy declared war on the Commonwealth. We can now go and declare war on France. Again, we're warned that this is something that you can never take back once you do it. And now Italy's declared war on two major powers, and they're done with their major power phase. Japan is not going to declare war on anybody. So it just says, OK, done. The next subphase of the declaration of war phase is to declare war on minor countries. Now, Japan isn't interested in declaring war on any minor countries, so it just clicks on OK, done. But Germany would like to declare war this time. It thinks that it has an opportunity to conquer both Denmark and the Netherlands during this snow turn. So we click on Denmark. We click on declare war. We're warned about that we're not going to be able to change this. We still say yes. That item is added to the list of war declarations. We'll go down here to the Netherlands and we'll declare war on that. And so Germany has declared war on two minor countries. I'd like to draw your attention to the special actions here. This is the area where the USSR would be able to claim Bessarabia or claim the Finnish borderlands. There are a couple other special actions that come up in here. But for now, we're done with this form. We go to Italy, and Italy doesn't want to declare war on miners, so it just says, OK, done. And now we're into US entry actions. 
The declaration of war of Italy on the Commonwealth in France is treated as a single action against U.S. entry actions. The number rolled was a five when assessing whether the United States would become upset with Italy declaring war on the Commonwealth in France. It did become upset, so it gets to draw an extra chit for the Germany-Italy entry pool, and that number was another two. This adjusts what the German-Italy entry level is for the United States, and it also makes a small modification to the Japan entry level. The tension pools are unaffected. There's another die roll for the Axis declaring war on Denmark, which had no effect. And there's a, yet a third die roll for the Axis declaring war on the Netherlands. That did upset the United States, and they get to draw yet another marker. And it's yet another two. So now we're at 21 and 19 for the U.S. entry levels. I want to take a quick look at some of the other items affecting U.S. entry. The United States is going to have the opportunity to choose entry options. These are all good for the allied player. For instance, you can permit the Chinese to build aircraft, or you could occupy Greenland and Iceland with United States troops, or the United States could provide escorts to the British convoys that are going across the Atlantic, at least as far as the United States East Coast. You can start Lend-Lease to China, you can freeze the Japanese assets, and so on. All of these choices have a target area, either Japan, Germany, Italy, or all three of the Axis major powers. So if you embargo strategic materials for Japan, that affects the Japan pool, but it doesn't affect the German-Italy pool. Likewise, if you send resources to the USSR, that affects German-Italy, but it doesn't affect the Japanese pool. The prerequisites for a lot of these are just the simply that you have the entry level high enough. And in this case we had 21 and 19, so if the German-Italy entry level has to be 21, we're pretty good to go all the way up to 19 and 20. Gearing up production is harder. We would need to have 22 points. There are also some other prerequisites. So for example, in order to choose the option Lend-Lease to China, you not only have to have an entry level of 17, but you must have previously chosen resources to China, which is one of the earlier ones. So in order to do Lend-Lease to China, we first have to do resources to China. Once we've done that, because we now have 19 in the Japanese pool, we would be able to lend lease to China. Whenever the United States chooses one of these options, there's a risk that a chit will move from the entry pool over to the tension pool. And that's what this number in the tension column means. So sending resources to China has a 40% chance that one of the chits, randomly chosen, from the U.S. entry pool would then move over into the U.S. tension pool. If we did U.S. escorts, there'd be a 70% chance that one of the chits in the German-Italy entry pool would move over to the German-Italy tension pool. I'm not going to try to explain the subtleties of all of this. It's in the player's manual and you can read it at your leisure. But for now, I'm just going to say, OK, done. And we're back to the pool where we just drew a marker for Germany and Italy. The next phase of the declaration of war phase is whether you want to break the packs. And in this case, neither Germany nor the USSR wants to break a pact. So I'll just say close here. Italy's just joined the war. They just became a major power at war with another major power. So they have the opportunity to call out the reserves. I'm going to say yes. Italy needs all the help it can get. Italy has four reserve units, and you could select to leave one of these in the reserve pool. But there's not really a good reason for doing that. So instead, we'll just bring all four of these units in. The Roman unit has to go into Rome. The Milan unit has to go into Milan. And the other two reserve units can be placed anywhere Italy wants. But they have to come in in a city. And when they come in, they're going to be disorganized. Reserve units arrive disorganized. And now that all of those have arrived, we can end this phase. The next step in the declaration of war subphases is to decide where the minor countries go. They can align to any allied major power because Germany was the one that declared war on them. 
So the question posed to the Commonwealth player is do you want to align the Netherlands? And we'll say yes. And the same question is posed about Denmark. We could say no here, in which case France would be asked if they want to align Denmark. If none of the allied major powers align the minor country, it immediately surrenders. That's rarely a good thing to do. And in this case, since France is in great danger of being conquered by Germany in the near future, we'll align Denmark to Commonwealth as well. We're now at the subphase to set up attacked minor countries. Let me bring up the sequence of play form, just so you can see what's happening here. We started with declarations of war on majors, then we did it on minors. We did U.S. entry in response to those declarations of war. We then asked the German player about neutrality packs, and he didn't want to break his with the USSR yet. We called out the reserves for Italy. We chose the aligning major power for the attacked miners, and now we're setting up those attacked miners. The next step is going to be voluntarily aligning miners and setting up any units belonging to those that are voluntarily aligned. For convenience sake, I'm just going to have all of these units set up in Rotterdam. I'm going to put the infantry unit in Amsterdam and the Netherlands East Indies unit in Batavia. These are not ideal positions for setting up the Netherlands unit. Instead, we would set up some of these naval units belonging to the Netherlands in the Netherlands East Indies, where they're not going to be subject to overrun by Germany. We now have the Danish units to set up. I'll put some of those in Rotterdam, one of them in Arnhaus, and one of them in Frederikshaven. For Japan, it has the option of aligning Siam. And in this case, I'll do that just so that you can see how that happens. This is a US entry action. But the random number rolled meant that the United States did not respond to Japan aligning Siam. We set both of these units up in Bangkok. I want to bring up the relationship form so that you can see how the major powers and the minor countries relate to each other. We're looking at the Axis major powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan, and their relationship to first other major powers, and then to an alphabetical list of the minor countries. So Germany's using its force pool with itself. It's cooperating with Italy, but it has no cooperation with Japan. It's currently neutral versus China. It's at war with Commonwealth and France. It is neutral with the United States and the USSR. It is also at war with a lot of minor countries because it is at war with the Commonwealth and France. So therefore any of the countries that are aligned to the Commonwealth or France are now at war with Germany. Italy is also at war with Commonwealth and France and a lot of minor countries and it has the element of surprise because it just declared war. That element of surprise will last for one impulse and one impulse only and there are many advantages to having surprised your enemy. Japan is mostly neutral with everyone. It's at war with China but for the rest of the minor countries it is all neutral. If we switch over to the allied relations we now have more major powers. We can see that the USSR and the United States are neutral with virtually everyone and that the Commonwealth has been surprised by Italy, France has been surprised by Italy, and other information here is that the Commonwealth has aligned Denmark, which just happened. If we go back and look at the axis, we can see that Japan has aligned Siam. As one last point on using this form, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that Denmark has been surprised by Germany because Germany just declared war on it. However, Italy has not surprised Denmark. Italy did not declare war on Denmark. Italy did declare war on the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth has Denmark aligned to it. So therefore, Italy is at war with Denmark. It just doesn't have the element of surprise. And this concludes chapter 12 of the training videos.